everybody, this is a lecture for non-experimental research methods. And so we've covered experimental methods. Now let's talk about non-experimental. So let's just keep it uh, as simple as we can. If we say experiments, we mean something that we have an experiment, a study that has an, a true IV. We're manipulating systematically a variable. <clears throat> so <clears throat> to call something an experiment, we have to have a true IV. So a non-experimental design is one that does not have a manipulation of a variable, uh, so therefore only has a predictor variable in uh, DVs, no IV, no true IV. In the next lecture, we'll talk about quasi-experimental studies, which are kind of in between the two, and I'll leave it to that lecture to define that more specifically. Uh, so that's the basic distinction. If you're manipulating something systematically to see the effect on a DV, it's an experiment. If you're just sort of measuring things that are already there, you're not manipulating any variable, then it's non-experimental. And we can actually have a mix of these methods. And so you can have uh, experimental design with non-experimental variables in it. And so we can have mixed methods that way. Uh, so for example, something I talked about in class before was the narcissism stuff. And so are narcissists more aggressive than non-narcissists? So narcissism, we can't manipulate. Uh, that's a predictor variable. And aggression is our DV. Uh, but we can think of an experiment where perhaps we can see under what conditions narcissists are more aggressive or become aggressive versus non-narcissists. And I talked about the manipulation, the IV of uh, false feedback. Somebody does a puzzle and you say that they either, regardless of the actual time, doesn't really matter what they do, you give them false feedback. Uh, one level would be uh, you're faster and better, smarter than 90% of the people that have done this task. So you're in the top 10%. The other level is you're worse than 90% of the people. You're in the bottom 10%. And so giving them false feedback, then you compare narcissist and non-narcissist. And basically, you're looking at the interaction between the IV of, uh, we call it ego threat. So if you get negative feedback about yourself, that's ego threat. Uh, ego threat versus non-ego threat. And does that interact with narcissism and it does. So I've set up uh, something I can draw on. So we have our IV of ego threat. So that's our independent variable. And we have uh, basically high ego threat. So they got feedback that they're not so smart. Low ego threat is that you're very smart, top 10%. And then we have narcissism, which is a PV. And I'm just going to break this up into two groups just to illustrate. So you can see we have high and, and low on narcissism. And basically, when you run the study and look at the levels of aggression, you know, non-narcissists are not going to show a lot of aggression under either conditions. And uh, narcissists under low ego threat are actually not that aggressive. In fact, if you kiss their butts, uh, they like it, and so they tend not to be aggressive. It's under these conditions when you are narcissistic and you have high ego threat that you're going to be aggressive. So th this type of mixed design can draw out these types of relationships between variables. So mixed, m mixed methods with uh, IV and a predictor variable can be very effective oftentimes. And I think a lot of you had that type of a design for your experimental studies uh, for lab number two. So typically, uh, since we are doing things that are not manipulated in non-experimental studies, we're looking at things that are naturally occurring. So those predictor variables that we just talked about are naturally occurring. We're not manipulating them. <clears throat> 
And one thing that I want to sort of emphasize is that this can be studied in natural settings in the real world, but you can also do it in a lab. Uh, the experiment, or I should say, yeah, it is an experiment because we have a true IV. Uh, the experiment of ego threat and narcissism is an example of lab settings. So I want to just sort of emphasize that because sometimes when people say uh, non-experimental, sometimes they, they mention the word correlational. Uh, I'm, not, I'm intentionally not using that uh, because I think it's misleading. Uh, so it's really about whether you're manipulating an IV or not. Really, you can do a lot of those types of research problems in lab settings. Uh, so oftentimes, people sort of imply that you can only do that stuff in the real world, and therefore it's really messy stuff. No, you can do it in a lab. You can do it under controlled settings. You're just looking at things that are naturally occurring. And a good example of that is um, research on couples. I'm sort of hesitating because I, I might talk about this later, but I'm going to talk about it now since it's really relevant. Uh, so, a major research design in studying a uh, couple's uh, conflict resolution uh, processes or strategies is to bring them into a lab and have them fight. So, how do they do that? Well, you bring the couple in, uh, and you typically keep them separate. Uh, so, you keep them separate, they're in se different rooms, and then separately you're going to ask each one of them a uh, list five topics, ten topics that uh, you tend to disagree with your partner on or tend to have fights about. So you have a list from both partners. You find the ones, one topic that is high, relatively high in both lists, and then you bring them back together and you say, okay, for this part of the study, I want you to sit here with your partner and talk about this topic, bam, and you leave the room and you record it. You might think, oh, that's kind of artificial. Well. People might act a little bit artificial initially. Uh, people might be reluctant, but generally speaking, within a couple minutes, uh, there'll be fights going on. And so that's one way that you can study uh, conflict resolution, is you can have, it, have people do it in the lab and record it and have trained observers code it for various uh, variables and constructs. So I want to really emphasize that because oftentimes, again, there's this um, anti-non-experimental designs in psychology, and there's all of this messy thoughts about non-experimental designs. So I want to clean that up a bit. So we often do this type of research in lab settings. It's not just in the real world. And if you remember, we talked about this issue already about experiments and cause and effect, and oftentimes uh, people go crazy and think uh, experiments are so great because you can talk about cause and effect, which you can, but I gave you already some views that challenge that, and I don't want to repeat those, so, uh, but what I'll talk about is, you know, some of the things, and we'll, this is some of a repeat, but I want to I'll keep on with the emphasis on, on non-experimental versus experimental design. So one issue with cause and effect arguments, traditionally uh, emphasizing experiments only, is uh, what we call reductionism. So uh, it reduces that problem to just one variable. Oh, I did an experiment and I showed that this IV causes a change in the DV. Well, that might be true. But that's not how real life works. There's multiple variables that are interacting in a situation that uh, affects people's behavior. Uh, so it's very reductionistic to, to assume that uh, this variable occurs in isolation in the real world. Uh, I call that a little bit of also reification. Uh, so sometimes uh, experiments will suggest an effect on a, a DV, and then people start reifying that variable and saying that variable is the thing, uh, when in reality we have no evidence for that. We have some evidence that it is one of the pieces of the puzzle, but to pretend that is it is the answer to the puzzle is false. Um, so we need to keep that in mind. Uh, so this idea that in the real world uh, there's many different variables that are interacting with each other in a situation to influence behavior. Uh, 
and that this really is the way that we are. We, we're complex. Um, so the simplicity of the experiment to try to make those links between variables as cause and effect sometimes start ignoring the complexity of the real world. And that's something we need to keep in mind. And then for the non-experimental part, uh, yes, uh, we don't have an experiment where we're manipulating stuff, but non-experimental designs oftentimes uh, have very elegant process level arguments about why our predictor variable relates to our dependent variable. So the types of things that you're going to be writing up in your introductions, those hows and whys, those how and why arguments are central. Um, so if you don't have an argument about that, even if you have an experiment that you think suggests cause and effect, it doesn't matter because you don't have any explanation for it. So having some good process level explanations about the connections between variables helps non-experimental studies have a bit of a push towards cause and effect explanations. And I mentioned this before in a previous lecture, the longitudinal studies. So if you do longitudinal studies over 20 years, let's say, and you're showing patterns of continuity or of um, development that's very predictable from theory and those process level arguments that we talked about just now, then longitudinal studies actually have you know, a decent push towards cause and effect. The things that we saw at age three are now relating systematically to things at age 23. And to sort of say that, oh, you can't say anything about cause and effect because you didn't have an experiment. Well, you can't do an experiment over 20 years. <laughs> But in the reality and the, the messiness, it's actually even maybe more evidence because the real world is very messy and development over 20 years is really messy. And being able to see something that's relatively substantial over 20 years should be like amazing. That should be remarkable. And so uh, one of the hallmarks of cause and effects arguments is the time placement of the variables, that something occurs before something else. The IV occurs before the DV. And therefore, that's part of your argument of the cause and effect. Same thing for longitudinal studies. So you have some stuff that you observed before, and you look at stuff after a number of years. So again, these are arguments that I'm making that are counter to the traditional view that just experiments can talk about cause and effect. And just sort of bring it, bring it out into sort of a, a more... Uh, explicit way of saying what's going on is there's an elitism of experimentalism. So there's, in the history of psychology, I would say that I'm pretty fair to say that there's this elitism of, of experimental psychologists, that somehow they're the ones that are doing the only true science. And if you're doing non-experimental methodologies, there's something wrong with you. There's a, a bunch of flaws in your studies. Um, and I think this is seen in our book. I think our our book has this phrase, um, you do non-experimental research only when you cannot do experiments. I think that's kind of a silly statement. Uh, so one of the things that we're fighting against is uh, this, these misperceptions of non-experimental designs that are often presented in textbooks and in courses on uh, research methodology or even statistics. And obviously, I'm trying to fight against that uh, elitism because I think it's flawed. And then to my uh, to my uh, perspective, it's also not scientific. So uh, some examples when you should actually uh, do non-experimental studies, even when you can do experimentals, is uh, beer goggles. So uh, we talked earlier in the semester about beer goggles. I'm trying to think about how much we discussed that in the lecture. But basically, um, again, beer goggles had to do with the idea that the more alcohol you consume, the more attractive you'll see other people. And so more alcohol, increase attraction levels. 
So they have done both experimental and non-experimental studies, and the experimental studies have been very good at ruling out alcohol. So they've been very good at saying, guess what? There is no such thing as beer goggles. But those experiments don't tell us what's really going on. So what's really going on when people are at parties or in bars and it's late and people start making decisions that are perhaps not the, the cleverest in terms of um, being to totally conscious of what they're doing, perhaps. I don't know if that's a wrong way of saying it. Well, I should just sort of say people make um, decisions that they regret later. I think that's a much fairer statement. And so, um, so what's really going on? Why, do, why are people making those decisions? It's not the alcohol. So people like to blame the alcohol. That's where the phrase beer goggles came from. But we know scientifically, experimentally, it's not the case. So what is going on? So to find out what's going on, they had to do research that was non-experimental that actually took place in bars. And when they looked at this research and they actually looked at this question in bars, they found out that it was time goggles. So it wasn't the alcohol, it was time was becoming limited. The bar was going to close soon, the party is going to end, and people start basically saying, well, if I want to hook up, I better start seeing people as more attractive. I can't be so picky now. So that, that was empirically found by non-experimental research. So this is a good example where we would not have an answer if we just use experiments. We just know that this stuff is not occurring, but what's happening, we have to go into the real world and look at what's actually occurring. So when do you do non-experimental studies? So uh, your book talks a bit about descriptive statistics, and that's true to some cases. So descriptive statistics, remember, are just describing your sample. So things like mean and standard deviation. Um, so uh, those things are easily calculated from sample data. So we can find out the answer to some questions like how accurate are people's first impressions? Uh, how many young adolescents vape nicotine? How many college students use condoms when having intercourse? So these are just example. Um, these types of studies, while they can be important for certain questions, uh, for example, public health questions and things like that, uh, they don't tell us what's going on. It doesn't tell us why are young adolescents vaping nicotine. Why well, do college students have intercourse without condoms? We don't know that. It's just what I call a body count. We just get a number or percentage of people and that's it. But we don't know why these things are happening. So the descriptive statistics stuff, uh, while it might be part of our studies, it's probably not a really great reason uh, to just do the studies and just get body counts because those things don't tell us about what's going on, why these things are happening. You know, probably more likely we want to do <clears throat> non-experimental studies, <clears throat> obviously, when we can't manipulate something. So when it's not feasible or it's unethical. So obviously, it's not feasible for me to uh, manipulate your personality. I can't change your personality. It's not possible to change your personality. Unethical, I can't, for example, manipulate how parents discipline their children. I can't tell one group of parents to use authoritative strategies, another set of parents to do authoritarian, another set of parents to be um, egalitarian. I can't do that ethically. That's not ethical. So there's, a t as you can imagine, there's a ton of very important things in psychology that we can't manipulate. It's not feasible or it's unethical or both. Probably um, both for a lot of things. It's both unethical and also not feasible. Another time, another reason for using non-experimental designs is doing exploratory studies. So sometimes we do a study and we're not quite sure what's going on. 
Uh, so we do a study. Uh, we study things that are naturally occurring to get a better sense of what's going on in relationship to our research question. Uh, this could lead to experimental studies, looking at it, once we have the better idea what variables are important, or it could lead to more precise non-experimental studies. So exploratory studies, seeing what's going on. And this is often when there's not a lot of uh, pre-existing research. So if you're doing a research question and you're not finding anything, uh, sometimes you need to do an exploratory study just to get started because there's not enough information out there in the literature. And obviously, uh, when we're doing uh, non-experimental studies, we often do things such as uh, your own self-experiences, so self-report data, uh, other people's perceptions. Uh, so oftentimes we do studies of uh, experts' perceptions of your behavior, so there's some observational data. It could also be informant data, uh, so people from your life who know you pretty well, uh, how, are, how do they perceive you? Um, so these, these types of questions are good for non-experimental studies, obviously, because we're looking at uh, naturally occurring behaviors, uh, even those that we can sort of produce in the lab, so if we're doing observer reports. And again, uh, I think the dichotomy that people put there of experimental versus non-experimental is a little false in the sense that uh, multi-method research is oftentimes uh, the best. Uh, so if you can do one study that you have both experimental and non-experimental aspects to it, I think that's a great design. But at the very least, we hope that will occur over many studies. So uh, if somebody is doing a bunch of experiments on narcissism, I, I also kind of would like to do a bunch of non-experimental studies on narcissists to see if I'm finding the same thing. So remember that each type of methodology in general in, uh, in research has its advantages and disadvantages. Same thing for experimental designs versus non-experimental designs. So if we have that nomological network where the pieces, the different research studies done by different people using different methodologies. So some people are using experimental designs. Some people are using non-experimental designs. If the findings from those studies agree with each other, then we have a lot of evidence for our hypotheses. So if you can't be multi-method in one study, I hope it occurs over that nomological network. And there's various types, and so uh, I think one of the more difficult things perhaps of this lecture is the book kind of throws so many things into this non-experimental world, and so we need to sort of unpack that. So they talk about correlational research, and so that's just a way of putting it that you just look at things that are naturally occurring and then you want to correlate them. And so that could be various things. So that could be just self-reports. So your self-report of your narcissism, and I have a self-report questionnaire of aggression. So how much does the self-report of narcissism correlate with the self-report of aggression? I think that's oftentimes how they talk about correlational research. Uh, one flaw of that study, type of study is that it's from the same source. It's from self-perception. So it's better if you have data from different sources. So if I get a self-report from you about your narcissism, maybe it's better for me to ask some informants, some of your friends about how aggressive you are in everyday life. That would be a stronger correlational design. So correlational design is just simply correlating two variables that are not independent variables. The uh, book also talks about observational research. Again, observational research is a little complex in the sense that it can be in a lab or it could be in a natural setting. Sometimes I think when people use the word observational research, they imply naturalistic settings. But of course, we can do that in a lab. We'd have somebody do a task in a lab. Uh, 
and we have an expert watch the person do the task and rate their personality. Or we could create a scenario. So the thing I talked about with the couples, uh, the couples in terms of conflict resolution, well, we can create a scenario where we have them fight and record the fight. And nice thing is in a lab is that we can usually record these things. We can systematically observe these things. So the data are usually pretty rich. And then there's uh, naturalistic observational research. And so naturalistic observational is that you go out in the real world, you observe people, and oftentimes they don't know they're being observed. So uh, that's a decent design. The uh, problem with that design, though, is that there's a lot of things that are going on that you don't know what's going on, and it's much harder to connect the variables because there's uh, a lot more noise. So there's less noise in a lab task or lab scenario situation. I think typically uh, lab observations, people often think again that they're so unnatural, people act weird. Uh, that's usually not the case. Usually people start acting the way they are. Uh, at best, people put up a front for a few minutes, uh, but usually it chips away. And usually people who are doing lab observational studies um, also have task or ways that you can kind of break down people pretty quickly. I know that sounds bad. I'm not saying break down and have them have a nervous breakdown. What I'm saying is get them to act like how they really act. Get them to drop the act uh, if, they're, if they are putting up a front and acting better than they really are. Uh, there's, there's lots of ways we can get people to uh, act more naturally. And usually it has to do with a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of pressure, a little bit of stress. A little bit of stress will, will do the trick. Um, so I never saw the movie, but I think Mary Poppins talks about a little bit of sugar, helps the medicine go down. A little bit of stress will help somebody act normal. <laughs> so if you ever are doing lab research and you want people to act normal, add a little bit of stress to the situation. They'll usually act pretty normal. And it's really easy for things like um, couples. Um, so you could put up a front for a little bit, um, not long actually, but for a little bit. But typically when you throw two people in together, it breaks down pretty fast. Um, so there's, there's pretty much almost no worry of unnatural behavior in these lab settings as long as you've done them well. And that's, the, that's the trick is you have to think of tasks or scenarios that will elicit, will promote people acting naturally. And uh, this quote down here is from your textbook um, saying that many of these things are qualitative. I would take exception to this. Um, many of the observational research methods I know of are quantitative. You generate quantitative data. Uh, even in a naturalistic setting, which I'm not super hot on, but people that do naturalistic observational research, they have a coding system. Uh, they have more than one coder, so they want to make sure it's reliable. And there's very specific things that they're looking for. You're not, you don't want them to be subjective. You're having them look at very specific things. And the lab task even more because there's a lot of control there. So you have a recording typically, so you don't have to worry about catching everything right away. So you have a recording and you have a very systematic coding system. And you have at least two coders independently observing these things, rating these things, and you want to see how much they agree. So. Uh, again, there's this sort of experimental elitism with these implications that uh, these methodologies are messy. They are not. They're highly controlled. And there's a, another type. Again, um, this is kind of the messiness of non-experimental non designs as they're presented in most textbooks is that there's a lot of different things that fall into this category. So another thing that falls into the category are developmental research design. So developmental is how people change over age. So are you different when you're three versus six versus nine versus 13? Um, not are you different, but how are you different, I think is a better way of putting it. And questions of things like continuity and discontinuity. So 
how you look at age 12 months, does that predict how you look when you're 23 years old? The answer is kind of yes, actually. Um, and also uh, discontinuity. So when there are changes, when people look different, act different, when they're three versus age 23, what's responsible for the, the changes that we saw with that person or with people in general? So developmental questions are those. How do people change? Do we see patterns of continuity and what's responsible for that continuity? Do we see patterns of discontinuity and what's responsible for those discontinuities in life? So there's basically three major developmental designs. And one is cross-sectional. Cross-sectional is simply you're looking at different people at different ages and you want to infer something about development by looking at the different ages. I think I'm just going to draw this. Maybe I'm in a drawing mood. So cross-sectional is basically like this. So let's say we have, I think I'm going to think of um, more like elementary school kids. So we might have um, some six-year-olds. We'll have some nine-year-olds, not just elementary, we might go to middle school here, and let's say 12-year-olds. So we have a group of six-year-olds, we have a group of nine-year-olds, we have a group of 12-year-olds. They're, they're just sitting in school somewhere. So we go to a school and we get data from the six-year-olds, we get data from the nine-year-olds, we get data from the 12-year-olds. We might even be able to get data on the same day really fast. And so one of the advantages of this is that it really, it's really fast. I can get data in, you know, realistically, it's probably within a week um, and could be even less. The problems with that is I'm looking at this group versus this group and this group and just saying that 12-year-olds look different in this way by comparing the 12-year-olds here with the 9-year-olds here. 9-year-olds look this way comparing this 9-year-old group with the 6-year-old group. The problem with this type of design is there can be a cohort effect. And there can be a, a bunch of different cohort effects. So the cohort, cohort effect basically means that something could have happened to one group of students, history or something else, um, that didn't happen to others. And maybe it was that change that is producing the differences between the 12-year-olds and the 9-year-olds and the 6-year-olds. It's not age. It's the different experiences that the kids have. So examples of this could be like curriculum changes. So let's say that the 12 year olds had passed elementary school and then all of a sudden the elementary school changed the curriculum. And so these students had different curriculum versus these students. And maybe it's the curriculum changes that has made the differences, let's say between the six, nine and the 12 year olds. It's not actually the age, it's the curriculum changes. And for sure, a lot of developmental researchers, I bet, are concerned about this. Not just in terms of COVID in general. I mean, there's a, actually a ton of COVID research going on now, how it's affecting kids. Uh, but, the, but COVID is actually going to produce some sort of cohort effects. And I could imagine that, you know, if you were doing a cross-sectional study later on, let's say um, three years from now, Let's hope, let's hope we get over COVID by then. So we have a group here that when they were early in elementary, they, they were part of the COVID stuff, which has been pretty uh, bad for kids in various ways. And so these kids were a little bit older when they encountered COVID. Uh, maybe they were more able to adapt to it. And these kids weren't in school. They were, you know, three-year-olds. And so... Um, it might have affected their parents' work, and that might have had an effect on them, but, but in general, it didn't affect their schooling because they weren't in school yet. 
So we might have a group right here that has a COVID effect, and this group has a lesser one, and this group might have a, you know, nominal, not very much of one. So if we saw differences here, it's possible it's because of COVID and the interactions with COVID, not because 12-year-olds differ from 9-year-olds, differ from 6-year-olds. So that's the main flaw of a cross-sectional design, is we're just comparing groups of people. But it can be done really fast. And then longitudinal, that's the next one, longitudinal right there. Longitudinal research follows the same people over time. So you'll find a sample of kids at age six. You do your measurements, etc. And then you follow them three years later when they're nine years old, measure them, follow them three years later, they're 12 years old now, measure them. So we have the same design basically from six to nine, or from six, six nine to 12 years old. Uh, but now we're looking at the same kids. So now we don't have to worry about cohort effects because uh, these are the same kids. So <clears throat> any changes that we see should be basically related to developmental changes with age. Not because of cohort effects, because they've all gone through the same experiences as a cohort. So that's a big advantage. And a big advantage then is it can actually link how people change. So those um, cause and effect arguments you can get from longitudinal studies start kicking in. If there's a pattern we're seeing across these six years of development, then there's probably something there. There's probably something going on here that was seen here that's causing development to go in a certain way at nine, causing development to go in a certain way at 12. The disadvantage of this type of design is it's, for one, it's very costly. So it costs a lot of money to follow these same kids up because you, you have to basically track them. You have to find them. Uh, with the cross-sectional design, you just grab a bunch of six-year-olds, grab a bunch of nine-year-olds, grab a bunch of 12-year-olds. It's really easy. Here, you've got to get the same kids, or else your study is dead. Uh, there's also a problem with what's called attrition. Is you lose some kids. So um, you might not be able to find them. You have some kids that are going to die. Well, that sounds bad, but when you do longitudinal research, you'll have people uh, die. Or if you're looking at older, sometimes they get institutionalized. Um, so the longitudinal study that I did my graduate work on followed the same people from age 3 to 23, and... We had, we had some people who died, some people who had committed suicide, some people who um, got murdered. Uh, and then we had people who also um, went to prison. Um, I think we might have had some murderers, but I'm, I can't say that 100% sure because that was, that was kept under locks in terms of uh, people knowing that or not. Um, but committed pretty significant crimes because they were in a, a long-term... Uh, sentences and so um, you know sometimes you can't get to those people uh, luckily I think for our study I think we were able to get, to get into the prison um, so somebody was able to go into the prison and at least do some assessments with the people that were in uh, in the prison but of course you know that prison environment certainly might have influenced what you could do how long you could do things how long you could see them how many different people could come in and see them. I'm sure there was some limitations to that. So you might have some attrition like that. Basically, you you lose people as you go on. Uh, attrition is okay. You hope to keep it low. Uh, one one way to keep it low is to keep contact with people. Uh, the worst thing to do is have people feel like you're just using them. 
Uh, you don't want them to feel used or the parents to feel used. Uh, so you want to keep uh, good connections with people. Uh, so they feel, uh, I don't want to say emotional, but, uh, you know, it is an emotional connection perhaps to the study. So the developmental research I just talked about, the longitudinal research, uh, from ages 3 to 23, uh, I was not directly involved in the data collection, but I had heard that one of the administrators, particularly the person who was trying to track people over time and uh, keep contact with them, was viewed as a second mother uh, by many of the participants. And so this, this uh, woman who would contact them every once in a while from the study um, to these kids started becoming like a second mother because I guess because of her personality. I don't think they ever told her to do this, but um, that she kind of became a connection, an emotional connection for many of these kids. So things like that can actually obviously help reduce attrition. So you want low attrition if you can, uh, but definitely what you do not want, you hope you don't have differential attrition. So differential attrition. Differential attrition means that, if I can spell it right, differential attrition, there we go, differential attrition. What differential attrition is, is that people are dropping out differently. So to me, one of the worst things would be, obviously there could be things like related to race and ethnicity that would be bad, gender that would be bad. Um, probably I'm guessing uh, something about low SES. So maybe some kids are moving, they're not uh, keeping contact with their previous schools, they don't contact the, the researchers, um, there's other stress in their life, so being able to be contacted later for research is not a priority for, for people who are, are struggling. And so this would be very dangerous because then you have a different sample. You have a different sample here versus here versus here, and it's a different sample in a bad way because it's becoming more limited in its diversity. Because let's say the lower SES people drop out, then you just end up with a high SES or middle class people. That's not going to tell us the whole picture of development. And so differential attrition is also a disadvantage of this type of a study. The other obvious sort of disadvantage is time. It takes a long time to do this. Uh, there's, there's pressure for people to publish, and so you can't tell um, your university that give me tenure because, tenure because I promise I'm going to have some really good research uh, six years down the line. Not going to work. <laughs> and so it takes a long time to do this. And the, the research I published, was it took 20 years to collect those data. Uh, I would never have been able to do that, obviously, myself. And so uh, to do a longitudinal study, you have to have a huge commitment by a core group of people and the government, usually, because the federal government's giving money and grants to do the research, uh, to keep this thing alive. And some of the realizations that you're going, yeah, you might benefit from it, but maybe other people are going to benefit, benefit from it more. Um, so the study I talked about, the 20-year 20 20 study, I guess the original investigators published a lot, but I'm guessing the ratio is probably 100 to 1 because there were so many other researchers that published off of it uh, that they actually um, didn't benefit super directly from the research because it was mainly other people publishing off the data they had collected during that time. So that's longitudinal. And then we have uh, cross-sequential. Cross-sequential is a mixture of the two. I'm thinking about how to best express this. So you start off with the cross-sectional. So you have a group of six-year-olds, a group of nine-year-olds, a group of 12-year-olds. You examine your research questions with these groups. You compare the different groups. They're different groups of kids. 
but then you incorporate a longitudinal design. So let's say it's three years. So they're three years down the line, your six-year-olds are now nine. You measure them at nine. Your nine-year-olds are now 12. If you're smart, you keep your 12-year-olds. Your 12-year-olds are now 15. So you can actually answer new questions from a cross-sectional. You can actually start asking questions about uh, middle adolescence now versus early adolescence and late childhood. But now you also start having longitudinal data. The six-year-olds to nine. 9 to 12, 12 to 15. And then you just continue. They started as 6, They you get them at 9 also, you get them at 12. They started as 9, you get them at 12, they're now 15. They started at 12, you get them at 15 also, and now they're at 18. So now in this cross-sequential data, you're starting to get longitudinal samples where you can actually have better data from the same people over some period of time of their lives. And you can just continue this if you want to. So cross-sectional is a combination of the two. So you can get some data right away. You have cross-sectional data right away. But then you have the advantages of having some longitudinal data as you go on with this. And the only real sort of disadvantage of this type of an approach is it's really costly. In terms of time, it, it's no more time than longitudinal study. A longitudinal study would take this long anyway. Um, but uh, you kind of have, not kind of, you have three longitudinal samples here. So you have created a lot of work for yourself. Uh, to maintain these three longitudinal samples in parallel. Um, so the cost is quite extensive, but what I'll say is that this cross-sectional design is really where a lot of the developmental research is going. So if you look at a lot of the developmental research that's coming out nowadays, it tends to be this cross-sequential design because of its uh, advantages. Uh, it, it lacks the disadvantages of the other two, except for the, the costliness. So in terms of non-experimental designs in general and validity issues, the big issue then is obviously the internal validity. So experimental designs has high internal validity because you're controlling all the other variables. The only thing that's changing is the IV, which is changed systematically by you, the researcher. And generally speaking, Non-experimental designs, which are referred to as correlational, non-experimental designs uh, don't have that control because you're looking at things that are occurring in, in real life, things that you're not manipulating. You can't manipulate them or they're unethical to do so. So you're going to have low internal validity because you don't, you're not controlling extraneous variables. And then we have a, a world that's in between, which is quasi-experimental, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. So I won't go into detail about it here. So I want to sort of focus in on the um, idea of correlational research. So correlational research, looking at things, typically what we're talking about at the same time. Uh, so we're not really talking about longitudinal studies here. We're just looking at naturally occurring things. I'm going to look at narcissism and aggression. It could be self-reported narcissism. It could be your informants, you, all of your friends report to me how aggressive you are. I relate those things. Uh, so why do we do that type of research? Well, we can make predictions. So um, correlations are also what we call simple regression. So I hope you learned in stats that correlation and simple regression are the same thing. So basically, I can run a correlation or a simple regression, and I can find out how much, I want to see if I have this here, actually I don't have it here, um, sorry about that, 
So in simple regression, I'm going to make it into a simple regression. It can be a correlation too. I'm just going to, I'm just going to uh, draw this out really roughly. So our outcome is aggression. Our predictor is narcissism. And we, you know, I, I won't make it perfect here, but you know, we can measure people and we can see the relationship. You know, everybody gets this is each dot is a person. So each dot is a person. What's your score on narcissism? What's your score on aggression? It goes into the scatter plot. And then in a regression, we find the line of best fit. So I hope you learned in your statistics that there's a mathematical formula for this. So there's a mathematical formula to find a line of best fit. And this line will have a slope. So you probably should remember this, if not from your statistics, from your basic math classes, probably back into when you were in fifth grade or something like that. There's a slope, the slope of the line. And there's going to be a wide intercept. So basically, you know, you can have a thing where you have aggression and it's equal to the y-intercept plus the score of narcissism times the slope. The slope of the line. I think that's usually a B, but I'm just going to put it down as an S. So, so that linear equation that you've all seen, I can predict aggression by taking the y-intercept from this line, which is here. That's the y-intercept. And then add that to the score of narcissism times the slope of this line. That will give me a prediction of aggression for anybody that I know of the score of narcissism. So that's what we mean by that's what, what we mean by prediction. If I have that simple regression line, I can predict your score on aggression if I know your score on narcissism. So we can make some sort of linear prediction. We can also make some sort of linear prediction if we have a multiple regression. Multiple regression is when we have more than one predictor variable. So let's say, say that I'm looking at aggression and we say, yeah, narcissism is part of it, but maybe another part of it is their um, emotional control. So how well are they able to control their emotions? I'm just going to make this really easy. So we can actually do a similar thing. So we can have emotion regulation, they often call it. We can add it to this. We can see how these two things predict aggression. And what will happen is we'll have another term. We'll have emotion regulation. And there'll be actually a slope for emotion regulation too. But the point is not the formula. I don't care about this formula. I just want you to understand that when we have regression, we can predict the outcome if we know the scores of the predictors. So if we know your level of narcissism, we know your level of emotion regulation. We can take those two things together and predict your level of aggression. So that's what we mean by prediction. So not only do we have the formulas where we can actually get a number, where we can, we can predict your number, but we know there's going to be some error, so we don't really care about that. But we can tell from those models uh, how much, what percentage of the outcome, what percentage of aggression is predicted by those other variables. So let's say I look at narcissism and emotion regulation, and I'm predicting 25% of the variance in aggression, that's pretty good. So it's not the formulas that we're looking at per se, but overall, how much of the outcome can we predict from the other variables? That's the real key. And I hope that you covered uh, at least simple regression, if not multiple regression, in your stats classes. That will help you sort of link these things. Uh, again, why do we do correlation research? Sometimes we can't manipulate it, so there's practically we can't manipulate something or it's unethical. 
Uh, we do correlational research to establish reliability and validity of a measure. So we talked about reliability and validity in measurement. And so a big thing, especially in terms of validity, is that we need some sort of external criteria. So if I have a new measure, let's say it's a self-report measure of narcissism, I can get informants observations of narcissism. So if my new measure works well, then it should correlate with some sort of external criteria about narcissism, which is their friends. Do their friends think they're narcissistic? If those things correlate, then I have evidence for reliability, and that's correlational. Um, external validity. So external validity, again, is about the real world. So internal validity is about controlling variables. Internal, internal validity is controlled, experimental control. External is can it really apply to the real world? And so with the beer goggles, all that internal control stuff is really good at ruling out alcohol as affecting attraction. It doesn't. We ruled that out with the experiments, but it doesn't tell us what's going on. So to find out about the time goggles, we had to actually do research in the real world, which is more correlational because we're not manipulating. We aren't forcing people to drink. We don't go to bars and force people to drink or force some people to drink less. We don't do that. We just look at how much people are drinking and we relate it to attraction and it didn't have an effect there. But we can look at people's attraction ratings throughout the night. And their attraction ratings are much higher for the same people late, 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 late before the bar closes, right before the bar closes, versus when they first step in the bar. When people first step in the bar, they're a bit picky. They think their, their chances are right much better than they are, I guess, in reality. And by the time uh, it gets to the end of the night, they know what the reality is, and they start adjusting their attraction ratings. You can only do that with an externally valid correlational study in bars. Experiments cannot uh, duplicate that type of a setting. We can do also convergent validity with experimental research. So we can have an experimental study. And we can see the findings of the experimental study, but then we can relate that to correlational research. So if I find something in a lab about narcissism and aggression, it's good if I can see that in correlational research in the real world. That's not just a lab situation that's created that. So I talked about that issue before. So basically think about that multi-method aspect. Uh, so correlational research can actually support experimental research. They're not in opposition. And when we talk about correlations, uh, we have to go over some simple review here of statistics. So correlations, basically what we're doing is we're taking a score on one variable here, stress, with a score for the same people on another variable, physical symptoms. And the idea is that physical symptoms is an outcome of stress. So if you have something that you feel is the, the outcome, is the DV, you put it on the vertical axis. And each of these dots is a person. So this person has a score of 10 on stress and three physical symptoms. So each of these dots is a person. And if you go down, it'll be their score on stress. If you go over, it's their score on physical symptoms. And... We can talk about the magnitude of relationship. So you have to distinguish between magnitude and direction. A positive correlation means as one variable goes up, right here on the right, as one variable goes up, the other variable goes up also. So this would be an example of a positive correlation. As stress went up, physical symptoms went up. If we drew a line here, it'd probably be about here. It's a pretty positive correlation. So the more stress you have, the more physical symptoms. That's a positive correlation. Negative correlation goes the other direction. As one variable goes down, the other variables goes up. 
So let's think about this as drinking the night, of, night before an exam. So studying and drinking at the same time. So if I look at your alcohol consumption, probably your scores on the exam the next day are probably going to be lower, I'm guessing. And those people who aren't drinking as much as they're studying probably are going to be doing better on the exam. That's just a simple example of a negative correlation. So negative and positive, just simply the direction of the relationship. Magnitude is how strong it is. So in the middle, zero means there's no correlation. There's no relationship here in the middle between these two variables. If you had a line of best fit, it's probably going to be a horizontal line here somewhere. It's pretty messy. There's not going to be any slope. You, it's, you can't predict one variable from another variable. There's no relationship. As you go to the point 0.5, there's a bit more of a correlation. So there's probably a line of best fit here. It has a pretty, pretty strong correlation, positive. This one has a pretty strong negative correlation. And the magnitude that they give here is 0.5. So if you remember R squared from your statistics, R squared is the percent of variance in the dependent variable that's directly related to the predictor variable. So if you're at 0.5, you take 0.5 times 0.5, you get 25% of the vari variance. So 25% of the variance of the DV is directly linked to the IV. I should say IV, to the PV here. Same thing for here. So it's about the strength of the relationship, how much of the differences that you see in people in terms of D, the DV is related to that predictor variable you're looking at. Here at 0.5 it's 25 percent. Perfect correlation, which is very rare. There's a line and nobody falls outside of it. So here if we drew a line, there's going to be some people who are off of it, correct? There's, not, there's going to be some people who are far from the line. Uh, we call those errors. So we can't perfectly predict your score on Y from X because we draw that line and only a few people fall on that line. This person, no, we can't because they got pretty high on Y in relationship to their X score. So they're a little bit different from everybody else. So a perfect correlation is that everybody's on the line. And there's a perfect prediction. Uh, this has a slope of 1, essentially. So as you change x1, you go up 1 on the y, or at least it's a perfect proportion. If you squared 1, it's 1. So 100% of the variance is accounted for. Again, that's very rare. So uh, from this slide, remember the difference between direction, positive and negative, versus the magnitude of the relationship. Uh, so this is cor correlation. This is for correlations. Uh, sometimes when we do uh, research, we find nonlinear relationships. So if you try to do a correlation here, it's not a correlation, but it's not a nonlinear relationship. We can see a curve here. If we actually fit the line right, it's not a line, it's a curve. And so hours sleeping per night correlated with depression. So people who are depressed oftentimes get less sleep, but sometimes they get more sleep. And then we have people who are in the more typical range of eight hours, and they'll be typically less depressed. So this is an example of a curvilinear relationship uh, that people who are depressed tend to get less sleep or more sleep. So when you do this, there's different ways of finding it. You can't find that with the Pearson correlation. If you told SPSS to run this with a Pearson correlation, it would come out probably as zero. It would be a non-significant relationship. But you've missed it because there's actually something there. The something that's there is actually a curve, not a line. So there's actually uh, ways that you can actually test this in SPSS. You don't need to know this. 
for class. Uh, but maybe we should look at this for your analyses later on, perhaps. But just to let you know, you can actually tell SPSS what to do. And it's called curve estimation. So curve estimation, you can see down here. It will test linear, but it will test a log. It will test inverse, a quadratic function, cube, power, S-curve, growth exponential curve. So there's all these types of curves that can be tested on SPSS. So um, usually when you're doing correlational research, it would be nice to look at your plot. Sometimes you can see things, sometimes you can't as a human being, but it's nice to look at the plot, see what it looks like. Um, if the data is pretty messy, which probably will be for most people when you have a large set of data, sometimes you can just simply um, plug these in. Plug in your two variables, choose all of these different types of curves, and then when you run this, basically what SPSS will do is it will tell you which type of relationship best explains the data. Is it linear? Is it some sort of curve? And what type of curve it is? So that would be one thing to remember if you ever deal with data in the future, because sometimes data are very tricky. And if you ask the computer the wrong thing, it will give you a wrong answer. So if you think, you ask basically the computer, is there a relationship? And limit yourself just to a correlation. I just ran a correlation. The computer's going to say, nope, there's no relationship. But you've asked the computer the wrong question. You didn't ask the computer whether there was a curvilinear relationship. And so you need to remember to do that sometimes. Another issue with uh, correlational data is that there can be a restriction of range. And so if you design your study, your correlational study, and one of your variables has a very restricted range, whether it's through your measurement or through your, uh, your sample selection, it will give you the wrong answer. So here's a very simple example. Um, so let's say that you want to look at the correlation between age and enjoying uh, hip hop. It's a little bit old, this textbook example, but let's just take it as it is. Um, so you do the typical thing that a lot of psychology research does. You go look at some undergraduates. And so all the undergraduates are 18 to, to 25, let's say here. So you get an 18 to 25 sample, and you run a correlation, and there's no correlation. You look at this box, there's no correlation. However, if you sample the larger range of age, that variable you're trying to correlate enjoyment of hip hop to, you start seeing there's actually a negative correlation. So there's actually a negative correlation, but you didn't sample anybody over 25, certainly not, nobody over 30. If your sample would have included people over 30, you would have found a different type of relationship. So we have to be very careful about our sample selection. If we restrict the range of our variable through our sample selection, that will give us a very limited picture of what's going on. Also, this is true for our measurement. So if I was measuring narcissism, and I only had uh, a few questions, and I didn't really get into all aspects of, of narcissism, you remember the, the old uh, domain coverage? So I didn't cover much of the domain of narcissism. I just asked a few things about it. I'd have a very restricted view of narcissism. My view of narcissism would be like that. I would only see a, a part of the picture of narcissism. That would squeeze my scores of narcissism into a box like this. And any sort of correlation I tried to do with another variable, I'd be unlikely to find anything because I didn't measure narcissism more completely. So. Some of this is about your sampling, but a lot of it can be about your measurement. Did you measure things so you can get a lot of differences between people? True differences. You don't want to ask things that create some differences that aren't there. But true differences. So I actually have a, a good perspective on narcissism. So we talked about uh, correlation and causation.
in another lecture. I'm just going to sort of deal with this sort of traditionally. This is a traditional view of this. Um, so when we have a correlation, uh, so we have a Pearson correlation between two variables. Uh, there's a problem of saying there's a causation because it could be a directionality problem. Um, so what causes what? So what causes what? So, um, you know, you might have something that uh, relates aggression to eating ice cream. And actually, that's going to come up later. Um, you know, is there, is there actually a causal relationship there? Or actually, let's, let's think of another example. I think I'm going to use that more as a third variable. Let's think of the relationship between uh, video game violence and aggression in children. So I'm going to look at this here. Because one of the reasons why I want to do this, I want to make sure I convey these things a little bit better. Oh, I don't want that ruler. So let's say that we look at um, the violence in video games. So violence in video games, and we're curious whether it's related to aggression in childhood. And we do a correlational study, and we find out how many, how many hours this, these kids spend playing violent video games and how, many, how aggressive they are. So we do this correlation, and we find a positive correlation. And we say these violent video games uh, cause uh, aggression. Well, somebody could say, well, we can't really do that because we don't know what the direction is. You're assuming the direction is this way, but maybe it's aggressive kids like playing violent video games. So maybe the direction of the causation is this way. So that's something that the correlation cannot address. I'm going to tell you kind of what the research suggests, by the way. So typically what the research suggests is it depends on uh, your predispositions. So if you are within sort of a large range of kids who are not prone to aggression, the relationship between violent video games and aggression is essentially zero. If you're not prone to violence, the violent video games are not going to make you act more aggressive. Um, but there's a group of kids who are prone to violence. Some of that could be um, genetics. There's some research that uh, there's a gene that helps break down the enzymes of the MAOA uh, neurotransmitters and that actually helps you metabolizing those those enzymes helps you uh, reduce your aggression helps you control your aggression and there's some people that have a gene that actually doesn't help you you lack that enzyme the enzymes not there so you're not breaking down those neurotransmitters as well uh, so it also could be um, obviously environment so it could be your family um, circumstances, other things like that, that would make you more prone. Uh, basically, if you're more prone, violent video games has a pretty high, at least moderately high, correlation. So there's a positive correlation. And you can see here, maybe, and this is part of why we want to do things like um, having some sort of correlational aspects, because you would not be able to tell us just from experiments. Because you were just doing experiments, you would not be measuring the proneness, because this can't be an IV. You can't make kids more prone or not prone to violence. That's not feasible. It's not ethical to do that. So this is something that could never, ever be purely an experimental design. But this, question, this breakdown helps us see there's some kids who are vulnerable. And there's some kids who aren't. There's no relationship. So that's the directionality problem. And we saw that there, if we could actually break down kids to uh, kids who are prone and those kids who aren't prone. Um, the third variable problem, basically what it's saying is, and I think I'm just going to draw this, is there could be some other thing that's causing this. 
So I'm just going to use a, a silly example, but I think it's fine enough. We've had a lot of serious examples, so, uh, you know. Ice cream consumption is positively correlated to aggression. To me, that doesn't make sense because if I have ice cream, I feel better. It's only if I lack ice cream, I get aggressive. So keeping that in mind, going to the actual third variable thing here is that you know, there's probably not really a direct relationship there. There's probably a third variable, and the third variable is probably temperature. Temperature goes up, people eat more ice cream. Temperature goes up, people get more aggressive. So it's really not these two variables that are connected. There's a third variable that is influencing this and influencing this in the same direction. But when we measure this, these two things look like they're connected, but they're not really. It's the third variable that's the influencer of these other two things. So that's sometimes what we call a spurious correlation. Spurious correlation is that it's there mathematically, but it doesn't, it doesn't really exist in terms of causality. So ice cream and violence, that correlation doesn't exist. There's no causation between those two. It's the third variable of temperature that's making it seem like there's something going on there. So let's talk a little bit about uh, more complex correlational research. Uh, some ways to look at this is um, looking at correlation matrices. Sorry about that. I want to do something different. So here's the matrix, matrix, if I can say it right. This probably looks fairly complicated, so I'm going to break it down a little bit. And I think I'm going to break it down through a picture of it. Let me take a picture of it so I can draw on it. This is actually from some of the research that I have done on attachment. Not the data set that we have. This is actually the data set from the longitudinal study that I talked about, although this is um, more correlational. This is all age 23 data from people. And so we actually have a few breakdowns here. I want to this will help you sort of read things. Whenever you have something that looks very complex like this, just break it down. So when I look at this, the first breakdown I see here is we have secure attachment and we have dismissing attachment. And it's relating those two types of attachment to personality. And some of the things are interpersonal. Uh, caregiving, availability with, to your partner, uh, being aware, interpersonally aware of other people, and then intrapsychic, so things like um, being anxious, being defensive, uh, being open to experience, tolerating ambiguity, um, being ego resilient, which means you're able to fluctuate your the control of your emotions uh, well with the different situations you're in. So this is actually looking at many different things and this is explained in the article which you don't have access here but this is the interview measure of attachment and this is secure attachment this is the self-report of attachment I'm gonna try to make this simple for now I'm gonna get into something a little bit more later in this lecture same thing, dismissing attachment, you measure it with the interview. Dismissing attachment, you're measuring it with self-report. And what this is simply showing is that if you're looking at secure attachment, it doesn't matter much whether you're measuring it with interview or self-report. You're getting the same types of correlations between the interview and the self-report. Although the interview does a little bit better. Um, but then for dismissing attachment, it totally breaks down. 
This missing attachment, we have a lot more correlations with the interview and personality, all those little asterisks. And then here's the self-report. There's absolutely no relationship between the self-report and personality here. And so simply what this is showing is that this is showing that we have to be careful because dismissing people will report themselves as secure in self-reports. And we know that because if we compare self-reports to the interview, for example, here for the dismissing, the self-report really sucks. The self-report, there's no correlation with personality, really sucks. The interview, we have a lot of correlations. So this is a, a fairly complex type of correlational research where you're looking at the correlations between many different things and looking for patterns. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because sometimes you hear uh, from textbooks and other things that correlational studies are just like one number. You do one Pearson correlation and then you, you run around and you make all these conclusions. Usually uh, non-experimental correlational studies, so-called correlational studies, is you have a lot of things going on. And you have to look at the complexity of those things um, to make some good inferences about your hypotheses. So oftentimes correlational studies are sort of portrayed as being simplistic, but they are not typically. They are usually fairly complex things like this um, matrix of correlations here. So it's a correlation matrix. Other sort of more complex correlational research is, is called factor analysis. So your book talks about this a little bit. What I want to sort of emphasize is that factor analysis is, is not purely research because what factor analysis does, it just looks at the structure of a measure. So if we think of a questionnaire, for example, a questionnaire on narcissism, I'm not going to, in factor analysis, I'm not correlating that narcissism measure with something outside of it. Factor analysis, I'm just taking my narcissism questionnaire and looking at how all the different people who took it answered the different questions. So it's about the relationship between people's answers for all the different questions on that questionnaire. So I don't consider that research because you're not going outside of the questionnaire. You're just looking within the questionnaire only. And what you're doing is you're going to be looking at clusters of response patterns. So we'll get into this a little bit later. I have an example that helps with this. Uh, the thing about factor analysis, it's statistics is this way in general. If you don't have good measurement, it's garbage in, garbage out. So you can find some really high significant core, uh, relationships between things, your variables. But if your measurement is crappy, those big significant relationships don't mean anything because you did a horrible job measuring things. Same thing for this. So if your questionnaire is crap and you didn't construct it well, it doesn't matter what the factor analysis says because your questions are just crap. Um, so uh, factor analysis is often talked about in terms of garbage in, garbage out because uh, there's nothing that compares it. There's nothing that outside of the measure that says the measure is working. It simply says the measure does this type of stuff. It has nothing to do with predicting anything outside of the measure. I think it's useful to look at an example. So let's look at an example with the big five. If you've ever had an uh, intro, I hope you remember the big five. Actually, I don't. I, I probably prefer you don't. But what I hope you remember is uh, the big five is kind of crappy. Uh, but the Big Five, basically, it says that if you, they state that if you look across the world and see how people think about personality, that all these different cultures have uh, Big Five personality characteristics that people think about and judge other people on. And an easy way to remember is ocean. So um, O is uh, um, openness to experience. See, I almost blanked on that because this is not the the biggest weight usually in the factor analysis. Um, openness to experience, 
Um, C is conscientiousness, E is extroversion, A is agreeableness, and N is neuroticism. Uh, so you, that you might remember those from your other psych classes. And so if you are a big five researcher, personality researcher, you're, you're going to have measures of that. So you're going to have a personality questionnaire where you think you're going to be measuring these aspects. And one way that a big five researcher would see if their questionnaire works is to do factor analysis. Because if, it's, if it is actually the big five, these things should be answered differently. So if somebody is answering about openness to experience, their, their answers to conscientiousness should be different. Extroversion, their answers to that should be different. These components should be unrelated, relatively speaking. So a factor analysis should, an analysis should pull apart these clusters. So let's look at a, an actual example. I got this. I assume this is from real research because um, I just basically Googled and I found this. Um, so they have ocean except um, the N is neuroticism. They put it as emotional stability. Um, neuroticism would be the opposite of emotional stability, but it's the same factor. So if you run a factor analysis, basically what you tell the computer to do is look at people's answers. And for those things that people answer the same, those questions, put it in a cluster, put it in a factor. However, for other questions, if they answer it differently, put it in another factor. So here they, they're claiming a five-factor solution. So these questions with an O, openness to experience, these three questions, what this means is people tended to ask these, answer these three questions similarly. Roughly the same answer. But their answers to these three questions differed from these three other ones. These three questions hung together. People answered them roughly the same, but they differed from these O questions. And so on. So the C questions, these three C questions were answered the same, but they were answered differently from these two other clusters. The E's, people answer these roughly the same. You can kind of see why. Talkative, sociable, reserved. So it's opposite coding. So um, yes, I'm talkative. Yes, I'm sociable. Uh, no, I'm not reserved. So those things go together. But my answer to that would be different from I'm lazy or I'm forgiving. I have a good imagination. Those are different things. So each of the clusters, each of the factors are hang together, people answer ES similarly, these three questions the same, but those answers didn't relate to the other factors. So this is a factor analysis. So these questions hang together and are different from these three questions, which hang together and are different from these three questions. These three questions are different from the others. These three questions are different. And each of these three in the factor hang together, people answer roughly the same. And factor analysis is a way you basically you dump all of these questions in. You run the factor analysis, and then the factor analysis pulls these things apart. Essentially, what it does is in the factor analysis, I don't want to really do this. Um, here's all your questions. And basically, it pulls apart these and says, oh, people answered these questions the same. Here's another factor. People answer these the same, but they're different from this other one. People answer, I can do it that way. People answer these the same, but they're different from those other two. And people answer these questions the same, but they're different from the others. So basically, the computer is pulling apart people's answers trying to find patterns in terms how they answer the same and how they're different in answering other questions on the same questionnaire. That's factor analysis. Again, I don't really consider that research. That's more about your, your questionnaire itself and whether there's subcomponents to your questionnaire. Uh, that's an important thing to answer if you're trying to measure different things, like the, uh, the big five.
um, but it doesn't tell us anything about what's actually going on and what's causing these differences. Again, more complex correlational designs um, continuing on some of the themes about these things is you're also exploring possible causal relationships. So here, um, you actually are getting a finer view of things. Um, so I want to make sure I have an example there. Actually, I have examples for both. So there's two examples here, and a lot of this can be done with different statistical techniques. Um, so the first example I have is with partial correlations, which is this. And so remember I talked about this already, and I highlighted this, but these were the partial correlations. I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible. So if I look at the interview, and I correlated the interview with personality, you can see here that there's a lot of correlations. Everything's correlated. And pretty highly so, actually. And if I look at the self-report and I look at the, the correlations, the Pearson R, there's all of these relationships here. There's quite a few relationships. But that doesn't really tell me, do interviews work better than self-report? Does interview tell me something different from self-reports? We actually have to do partial correlations for that. So if we look at the partial correlations, which are here, I'll explain partial correlations in a second, we'll see that the interview is very much superior. So if we look at the partial correlations, there's a lot of significant ones here. There's only a couple, a few, for the secure. And then if we look at partial correlations for dismissing, there's quite a bit here for the interview. The partial correlations is basically zero for dismissing and the self-report. So what are partial correlations telling us? I'm going to sort of go into that in a second. So it's just qu quite simply what I just mentioned just now. I wonder if I can delete this or whether I have to redo this. Um, I have to redo this, I think. Give me a second to do this. So conceptually, what a partial correlation is telling us in this case is, can we learn something different from an interview of attachment versus something from self-report, and vice versa. The self-report of attachment tell us something different from interviews. So we can only do that with a partial correlation. I think I might, might do both. So here I'm going to look at self-report. So we have self-report attachment here. And just as a cluster, we have all of these relationships with personality. The Pearson R is the intersection here. So Pearson R just tells us the bivariate correlation, the correlation between two numbers, two variables. So that's this overlap right here. What a partial correlation does is it takes something else. In this case, it's the interview measure of attachment. And it basically asks, how much overlap is there? And if we look at this, it's kind of like this. The partial correlation is actually right here. This little area right here is the only thing that we can say that's special about self-report and personality because the rest of this right here, the interview overlaps with it. So with a partial correlation, we're taking out the overlap of the third variable and asking what's simply unique between self-report and personality that can't be explained, isn't explained by the interview. And it turns out in this case, it's very small. All this other stuff here is just an overlap with the interview. So partial correlation just tells us the unique relationship between two things. 
self-report of attachment and personality in this case when we take into account a third thing. In this case, interview measures of attachment. And then we did the other, the other thing. And I'm, I'm going to try to keep it, you know, representing what we found. So then we can ask, well, what does interviews, what do interviews tell us that self-reports can't? Is there something unique there? And, you know, we have a, a correlation. I think the correlation was bigger. But that's a Pearson correlation. And then we asked about self-reports. Well, what if we, if we include self-reports, well, how much does that overlap with interviews? And when we looked at this, it was kind of like this. So the overlap was relatively small. So there was a little bit of overlap. Basically, this is the stuff about personality that both interview and self-reports sort of agree on. But all of this other area here is, there's a large area here, is the partial correlation. So if I fill in all this space, you know, taking out this area of overlap, it's a pretty good partial correlation. So there was quite a bit of unique stuff about personality that our interviews told us that you cannot get from the self-reports. So that's what a partial correlation is. It gets into more complex issues. Uh, this was not causation per se, but you can do causation also. Um, so you can do causation. So you can, I'll use that example that we had earlier. We had, right, we had the violent video games. Actually, it's kind of a suppressor videos, but uh, I should, uh, it would be a little bit more difficult to draw that. But basically, uh, violent video games, and then we had uh, aggression. And there's some correlation. But then we, when we looked at personality, so uh, let's say proneness to violence, which turns out to be a PV. Um, when we looked at that, you can kind of see there's a mixed picture. So proneness to violence actually comes in there and says there's an overlap here in that correlation. And so the actual correlation for everybody is more modest. And then this type of uh, finding, if you did a partial correlation of this, and you kind of saw, well, proneness to violence is starting to carve up this relationship, it can lead to more relationships, or I'm sorry, more research, which then found that relationship I just talked about. Basically, if you're not prone, it ends up the correlation is zero. If you're prone, oh, I'm sorry, it's zero, not a positive. So if you're not prone to violence, pretty much the violent video games are not going to have a thought. If you're prone to violence, there's going to be a positive correlation. So this really got to, you know, this gets to causation. So it's not that violent video games causes aggression. It's that if you're prone to violence and you're playing these things, it's going to make you more aggressive, but not for people who aren't prone. So this type of uh, partial correlation can lead to these more refined causal explanations. I think probably already, and maybe you might be having some trouble with this lecture, is that you can see when we move from experimental designs, which has this simple, simple arguments about what's going on, when we move to non-experimental designs, it's a much more complex picture. We just can't say one thing causes another thing, there's various things that are going on. In the real world, various things are going on. And to understand that, we need to think about these interactions be between all of these different variables. And then we can do multiple reg regressions. And so multiple regressions can also help us rule out uh, possible factors, causal factors. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to also capture this so I can draw on this.
So basically, this is a multiple regression, and actually, it's a, it's what we call a hierarchical regression. So in a hierarchical regression, what we have is we have all these different variables we're seeing, whether it affects an outcome. But we add variables later on to see whether that mixture changes our conclusions. So here the DV is aggression. So we're looking at aggression again. So a very aggressive day today. Sorry about that. And this is with kids. So uh, aggress aggression levels in kids. And so the first model, and I've drawn a line. So in the first model, I can't draw over that because there's a thing with my recording device that I can't do that. But the first model right here, it comes up with these conclusions. It basically says that sibling aggression and parenting style predict aggression. And if we looked at the standardized B, the parents seem to be twice as influential on aggression as siblings are. But here we have video games again. So we have video games now. So instead of just looking at these two things, which was looked at previously, we now add in to the mixture the use of video games, of computer games. Does that change the picture? Actually kind of does. So parents... Parenting style are, again, related to aggression. And now, actually, using computer games is related to aggression. But now, siblings are not. Siblings are not related to... Sibling aggression is not related to aggression now when we added the factor of video games. Now, if we look at this, you know, parents are still the number one factor. Uh, but, you know, video games is not too far behind. So what this suggests to me is that there's nothing here about sibling aggression that's sort of special. Uh, when you throw in video games, computer games, these look like, to me, these are probably played oftentimes with siblings. They're looking at a pretty young age group here. So probably playing with their siblings, and the sibling aggression gets magnified or not magnified through the use of computer games. So computer games are kind of throwing fuel on the fire, I believe, if you look at these data. So we can do multiple regressions and we can look at how things are influencing our dependent variable. So this is, again, a more complex approach to non-correlational research and using statistics to answer questions more complexly. And in a study like this, we can rule out something that people think, oh, yeah, it's siblings, it's just siblings. Well, not really siblings directly, but maybe how siblings are playing computer games together. And maybe that's the thing that we need to look at, which I think is a, a very interesting sort of conclusion. So those are examples of some pretty complex correlational designs with using more sophisticated statistics to answer these questions. So again, part of this is to get you thinking about how do we answer questions in psychological research. Um, also part of this is just simply resisting the portrayal of non-experimental designs as being simplistic somehow and um, being rudimentary compared to experimental designs. It's simply not true. We're going to end with uh, qualitative research. I'll do this relatively quickly because, again, our focus here is on quantitative. But qualitative research is described in your textbook, and it's worth some mention. So qualitative research simply means, again, not numbers. So a lot of this stuff, we can make it into a dichotomy. So quantitative research, we use numbers.
you know, that's where we get to levels of measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. So sometimes our numbers are just conveying a category, which is nominal. Uh, but qualitative is just, I shouldn't say just, it's a sense of our words, essentially. So qualitative are words. Words are the data. So quantitative numbers are the data. Qualitative words are the data. And those words can come from different sources. Um, the words can come from you. I think I used this example before. So if you're going to be going to the business world and uh, your company is producing a new product and they want to do some marketing research and uh, you might then, as a researcher for them, present the product to uh, some pilot groups and uh, one of the things you might have them do is just generate words. So, well, here's, here's a new iPhone design. What words come to your mind right away? Use, you know, use it for two minutes and what words come to your mind? So those words from other people are going to be used in that research because those are really important. So if they say things like uh, dull or hard to use, um, can't see, you know, those, those would be horrible things and you have to correct those things. Uh, but if it's something like, oh, this is, you know, easy to use, um, uh, easy to handle, easy to navigate, you know, things like that would be you know, fantastic words. But the words are the data and they're coming from the customers. Uh, the words can come from the researchers. So some qualitative research is uh, somebody looks at something. So it could be some naturalistic observation or it could be recordings of something. Um, it could be various types of data. But in a qualitative study, the researcher will provide a description of the data in words. Um, so. If there's a description of the data and words that's coming from the researcher, that's qualitative also. So the words can come from the participants, the words can come from the researcher, but words are the data. So when you use, use qualitative research, sometimes you do it to generate new ideas, new research questions. So um, if the quantitative stuff has been sort of solved, but there's some things about, well, what's going on actually? and why are people doing this or how are people experiencing these things? You might do more quantitative research. Uh, I would hope that would be followed up with um, quantitative research to sort of verify your qualitative perceptions. Uh, you might do it to get a thick description. So qualitative research has often been talked about in terms of thick description. So for example, um, in anthropology, people might argue that to understand a culture, you just can't have a bunch of numbers. Uh, you can't have numbers and just have relationships because you can't really understand what culture really is because culture is really a complex thing. So sometimes in anthropological research, they do thick descriptions of cultures um, to give, give people a sense of what it is to be in that culture, what are the things that are driving people to act in certain ways in that culture. And those are narrative thick descriptions. Also, it could be a, a context. Um, oftentimes, they t call it lived experience. Um, so, for example, with uh, trans identity development, I have my quantitative data and how it relates to minority stress um, and other things, you know, discrimination, other things that trans people deal with every day. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily tell me what it is to live with that every day. So, some research that is more qualitative talks about lived experiences of people, um, gives you that sort of a phenomenological perspective of what it is to be in that position. So it tells us something different about the, the human experience, if you will, uh, versus uh, numbers. So there's lots of different qualitative methodologies. You can do observations. Uh, I would say that these would tend to be naturalistic observations. So you would have an observer, trained observer, and um, do narrative uh, word-based descriptions of what's going on. Um, you could have interviews. Um, certainly interviews, you can generate quantitative data. So the interviews I've done is I've used those largely to produce quantitative data. But qualitative data you can get from interviews also. So um, you could just simply do a qualitative methodology and 
try to find themes. So that's what you typically do. If you're doing a purely qualitative analysis of interviews, you look at all the interviews, you try to identify themes from the interviews. So across different people, across different interviews, these are some of the themes that came up. And then you might have some quotes from interviews as illustrations of that theme. Uh, but you don't just have to do that. So you could actually have quantitative methodologies. So I can have uh, quantitative measures of attachment. And if I want, I can go find the most securely attached people, and then I can find uh, their interviews and look for quotes that illustrate security and, and attachment. But those were derived from quantitative scores. And that's basically what I did. Uh, so uh, some interview quotes that I use in my classes and I've used for research presentations too uh, to illustrate uh, the narrative qualities of attachment from the interviews. I've, I simply just ran numbers and I found people who were highest on dismissing, highest on preoccupied, highest on secure. I watched their interviews and I got quotes that illustrated their attachment. Um, so you can use both actually. So you can use the qualitative to illustrate more deeply to people about what it means to have those num numeric scores of being high and secure, high and preoccupied, high and dismissiveness. And I think that's an effective use of, of qualitative is to use it in conjunction with quantitative data. Uh, you can do focus, focus groups. So focus groups is you sit down with a group of people who've shared some experience and you try to find themes. Um, so I did that in uh, Hong Kong. When I was in Hong Kong, I was doing uh, educational research at a university. And one of the things I was asked to do was uh, to do an evaluation of their outgoing international exchange programs. And so what we did is, uh, and I had kind of like an, I want to say assistant, but she was sort of a junior colleague uh, who was training uh, in research. So a junior colleague and I, and she was helpful because she was a native Cantonese speaker. I didn't speak any Cantonese, but that wasn't, that never became an issue, I think. Um, all the focus group interviews uh, occurred in uh, English. And so... Uh, what we did is I think we broke, up, broke them up. I think we had a group of outgoing exchange people who um, went to mainland China. So Hong Kong is a part of China, but not exactly a part of China. It's what's called a semi-autonomous region. So they considered people who went to mainland China and, and do their international, they considered that international exchange. Uh, so if they went to a school for a semester in mainland China, that was considered an exchange program internationally for Hong Kong. Uh, but then we looked at people who went to Europe. So we had a group of people who went to Europe. And I think we had a group of people that went to Australia. Um, so we kind of broke it down by where they went to because we figured they might have different experiences. Um, so we basically talked with these people. We had some questions. Um, so we had some questions we wanted to ask. And then we had uh, flexibility that we had follow-up questions. So if something came up that we didn't anticipate, we could follow up and ask them more about that thing that came up. And so we basically conducted these things. We recorded it. Uh, we analyzed it. And we extracted themes. And so we basically went back to the people in charge and said, these are some of the things that students are learning. Uh, this is some barriers to their learning. These are the good supports. These are things that you need to do better. Um, so that was an example of a focus group. So focus group of students going on international exchanges. A content analysis. <clears throat> so here you can uh, look at things like narratives. So you could look at uh, diaries of people. Uh, you could look at people's uh, vlogs uh, if you want to. Um, you could look at people's um, social media accounts. Um, you could actually look at media too. So you can look at television shows um, or shows on Netflix. Um, and you can analyze the content of these things. Um, so, for example, one of the things that oftentimes students like to do is they like to do narrative analysis of media, and they will look at media and see how gender roles are portrayed in the 70s versus the 1990s versus uh, today, let's say. Um, so have gender roles been portrayed differently across time in, in media, um, in movies or TV shows? Um, so those are 
other examples of qual qualitative methodology. Uh, again, the, the end result would be um, patterns that are described in words. And typically with qualitative data analyses, um, they're using what's called grounded theory. So basically with grounded, what's called grounded theory, what they do is they look at the data, <clears throat> again, the data are words, and then they try to generate a theory and a hypothesis to fit patterns in those words. Um, so typically what they do is they, they do things such as they identify repeated ideas and data. So they try to look for themes, so repeated ideas. Um, the ideas are usually more specific. <clears throat> and then what they try to do is they try to organize these ideas into broader themes. So there's this, these ideas, and now, oh, there looks like to be a theme here. And then what you do is you um, look at those themes and then you write a theoretical narrative. Um, so you use the themes and then you try to focus on the subject's experience, so the subjective experience of the participants. And then usually what you're doing after you have generated those themes, you're looking for quotes from the narrative that support those themes. So you start with the really specific stuff, all of the words, all of the narrative stuff. You start finding some similar things that different people say or uh, similar things that have been observed about different people. You take those pieces that start holding together and you start generating broader themes. Those broader themes are usually uh, based on some sort of psychological theory. And then you go back, once you have the broader themes, then you go back into the data and you try to find quotes that support the themes uh, as part of your presentation of your data. So it's, it's quite different from uh, the quantitative approach. So the quantitative approach, we have our theories and hypotheses to start with. Those generate our measures. And then we test those theories and hypotheses with the data. Here the data are essentially generating the theory and hypotheses. That's why they're called grounded theory. I think um, probably a lot of people in psychology are a little bit uncomfortable with this approach because um, people can kind of see things that they want to see. I think that's probably the biggest criticism uh, from a sort of psychological quantitative research methodology is that the big danger here is you start seeing what you want to see, you make up your own story, and then you find pieces that fit your story. Um, so that's why probably a lot of us are a little bit uncomfortable with this approach. And just here's an example of um, some quali qualitative research. So they did um, some, th some interviews with new mothers, and they found out that there was um, various themes that came out with new mothers. And I think these were new mothers who were from uh, low SES backgrounds, so um, who had some sort of vulnerability. And they might have been single mothers also. Um, so some new mothers who had some vulnerabilities already. And so they did interviews with the mothers, and then they looked at what the mother said, and then they extracted these themes. And then they would find some quotes that related to the theme to illustrate the theme. So this is an example of a, a qualitative approach. In general, you know, I've been kind of saying this quite a bit, a mixed methods approach is probably better. I'm, I'm fairly uncomfortable, actually, to be quite frank, with a strictly qualitative approach. I think uh, qualitative approaches are great if they're used in conjuncture with uh, quantitative approaches. Um, we get a little bit of what's called triang triangulization. Um, so basically, triangulation just means that different sources of data are saying similar things. So if I have some quantitative data and the qualitative data sort of support that, then I start thinking there's you know quite a bit of evidence for this then. And I would say it's actually actually more than triangulization. 
Um, it actually can help you understand things better. So uh, I think I talked a little bit about this with my trans identity data. Uh, it was relatively simple for the qualitative. It was, it was definitely 98% quantitative and then um, a little bit of qualitative. Uh, we asked three qualitative questions. We asked um, them, think about your best relationship. How did it affect your identity development? This is as a trans person. Um, think of your worst relationship. How did it affect your identity development? And then the third question was, um, in terms of qualitative, uh, think of your identity development. How has your identity development as a trans person affected your relationships? And so, you know, we got, we got the quantitative data and the quantitative data were quite strong. Um, but then the qualitative data really illustrated to me different pathways. Um, so there's actually different pathways that I saw in the qualitative data. Um, just give me a second here. And I thought it would be um, nice to kind of show some of the themes from the qualitative stuff. So we got quite strong numbers, um, statistical relationships between uh, various aspects of uh, identity development and romantic relationships and other things. Um, but the, the themes really kind of showed a lot of diversity. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a, there was a theme of having, it was really important to have uh, one's exploration of one's identity um, as a trans person affirmed by their partner or not. Um, so you can pause this video if you want to see the quotes. Um, you know, some people avoid romantic relationships because they feel it's difficult for trans people. Uh, fearing rejection, uh, being treated like, as a fetus, a fetus, uh, as a fetish, and not being seen as a whole person. Um, and so these were themes that actually came out in the in the uh, qualitative data. And then um, another theme that came out was um, partners getting confused between gender identity and sexual orientation. They're they're different. Uh, you can be a trans woman. Um, if you are romantic, romantically attracted to other women, then you're a lesbian. Um, if you are a trans woman and you're attracted to men, you're heterosexual. Um, so, um, you know, this, this idea is not necessarily well understood by a lot of people, so it can actually lead to some real problems for trans people in dating. Um, Issues of sexual orientation. So if 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 you're uh, assigned at birth as a woman and you're dating uh, a woman who sees themselves as lesbian and then you transition uh, to become a trans man, um, then your partner might say, "Well, what I what am I doing in this relationship? Because I think I'm a lesbian instead, and now you're now you're a man. So what does that mean for me? That can cause problems in relationships with trans people." Um, influence of binary versus non-binary gender roles and norms and relationships. So some partners believe in gender binary and that men and women should be different in relationships and others don't. And that can obviously affect people who are transitioning. A um, whole bunch of things in terms of uh, sexual desire and physiological and body structures. Um, along with fears of partners' expectations about sexual behavior. Uh, there can be some things that are um, a lot of uh, conflict, uh, guilt, for example, if you're married and um, your trans identity is sort of coming, coming to the forefront for you, that, that can come with a lot of guilt um, if you're in a marriage. Um, you might conceal your expiration from the partner. And then there's some people who just said, hey, they're not connected. So my gender identity and my relationships, they're just two separate things. They're not connected. This was, this was probably a theme that I was um, probably most surprised about. But in general with these themes, um, you know, some of it was surprising. Some of the qualitative data clarified things. And so I think this is a, a good example of um, had a lot of quantitative data that looked at relationships, statistical relationships between things, but when I looked at the qualitative themes, the answers to those questions that I asked, they were just simply three questions. It actually got me to kind of understand uh, everybody more as an individual. Um, so it got me to sort of understand the experience 
of trans people in relationships, in their identity exploration, exploration more vividly. Um, so I think that's more than just triangulization. I think it's also it adds a lot of depth to understanding what's going on in the statistical relationships that you looked at. And then I think we're pretty close to the end, if not at the end. Oops, where are we? Almost at the end. I'm going to go very briefly over these other things. So um, observational methodologies, there's naturalistic observations. That's where you go into the real world, you watch people. Um, those things can be structured versus unstructured. Um, unstructured, I would not recommend. Unstructured is very difficult because you're just kind of watching. You're not quite sure what you're looking for. Um, unstructured might be useful as a pilot, as, um, well, I want to kind of do this, but I'm not sure how exactly how I'm going to do this, what it's going to look like. So you might go in and just go and kind of see what you can see um, to get a sense of what's out there. Um, but that's not really good for the final research. For the final research, you should probably be structured, which means you have a sampling scheme. So sampling means that if you're looking at something, uh, you have to, you can't pay attention to everything that's going on in the natural environment. You have to choose people. So if you're looking at something, uh, you might say, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch every fourth person." So you might be sitting somewhere on a park bench. One, two, three people pass by you. Fourth person, you're gonna watch them and code for them. That's the sampling procedure because you can't do everybody. You can't watch everybody. So you have to make some sort of decisions of who you sample. And then typically you have a coding system, and uh, you usually develop the coding system very um, well because you want to make sure that you can capture the data. So you have a coding system that you can use in the real world. You're not going to miss anything. You're not going to feel rushed. You're going to get all the data down. Uh, there are also uh, differences in terms of disguised versus undisguised. So undisguised basically is that you kind of make it known you're watching people. And sometimes um, this is done like in um, workplaces. So sometimes people have done research in workplaces and, you know, the company hires a researcher and wants to see what affects worker productivity. And so they tell people there's going to be people coming in, they're going to be watching your work and they're going to see what, what will make you work better or something like that. So people come in and obviously it's too obvious to the workers that, oh, here's a researcher because they're just sitting there watching us. Um, so it's definitely undisguised. Um, the problem with undisguised methodologies is that people become very reactive. They act differently. So that work example is exactly where they got this, what they call Hawthorne effect. So simply by watching people, they're going to act differently. Um, so Workers are not going to behave normal when you think you're watching them and they think you're evaluating them. So they're going to act differently. Um, so that research might not be very helpful. Uh, I guess in the business world, what they've done is they can't do it in the factories, perhaps, but maybe more in the commercial settings, the, the what do they call it, the secret shoppers. So secret shoppers who um, work for the company, but then the people who are um, helping them out um, they don't know they're secret shoppers. So whether that's in a restaurant, fast food, or in Target or Walmart or something like that, they're secret shoppers, and what they're doing is they're evaluating, they're watching people to see how they treat the customers. So they're disguised, so there's not that reactivity. And that's why, that's why companies use secret shoppers, because they want to see actually what's going on. And there's, there's disguised, so you don't let people know. Uh, you're watching them. And if it's uh, public behavior, you usually don't have to inform them afterwards. You can usually watch them and just let, let, let them go on. Uh, there's participant observer that's used a lot in anthropology, cultural anthropology. So somebody goes to another culture, uh, and that could be in America. It doesn't have to be somewhere overseas. It could be, so, uh, there was a famous study of gang culture, for example, where somebody became a participant observer in a gang. I'm not sure. They probably paid the gang, gang money um, to be part of the gang and maybe to protect them um, as a researcher, but they became part of the gang. And the idea is that as a participant observer, you are kind of part of the group, but at the same time, you have to be the objective observer of what's going on. 
Um, so you try to be part one foot in that culture and one foot out as somebody who's objective and can analyze things. And again, there's disguised and undisguised. Um, so um, undisguised is that, again, people know you are from the outside. Disguised is that they don't know. Uh, so you, you basically infiltrate another culture and pass as being part of that culture. Um, that's gets more natural behavior, um, but um, depending on the, the culture you're infiltrating, it might also lead to some um, possible dangers to your personal health. Uh, structured observations, so that's things like labs. So, um, you know, bring people in the lab, have them do a task or have them fight, um, do whatever. Um, there's a structured task, there's structured ways of coding for those things. And this again is the, the issue with this topic is that there's uh, many components that lie in under uh, non-experimental designs. Case studies, so case studies could be, um, could be different things. The unit of analysis can differ. I think when you think about case studies, you often think about a person. Uh, so in your psychology classes, you may have had some case descriptions of somebody and it describes them. Uh, one of the first ones you may have read was the, that guy who had the railroad spike uh, sh shoot through his brain uh, and how it changed his um, uh, acting with other people. What was this? Uh, I'm blanking on his name. I'm going to look it up. This guy, Phineas Gage. Uh, almost every, it seems like almost every introduction to psychology, introduction to psychology textbook has his, this guy's case study where this railroad thing shot through his head and affected parts of his brain. And uh, from that case study, um, you know, depend, you know how his behavior changed, how his emotions changed, uh, gave us some ideas about uh, parts of the brain and uh, what functions those parts of the brain uh, have. And so uh, psychology textbooks oftentimes have case study descriptions of specific people, but case studies can also be events. Um, it can be a, a company, so you can have a case study of a company if you want. Um, so you look at something and you want to go deep into it. Uh, typically it's usually qualitative. So usually there's qualitative descriptions of the person, of this event, of this company. Um, so it's usually a pretty um, thick description of that person, event, or company. And then we have archival research. And so that's where we might do some content analysis. Um, so archival research could be um, things from your social media account. So somebody, somebody gets permission from you, hopefully, um, to go into your social media accounts and looks at all your posts, looks at the pictures that you have, looks at your replies that you get, give to other people, and has a way of coding those things. Um, so content analysis is looking at something that's existing already. It could be your social media material. It could be diaries. It could actually be um, media, so television, shows, movies. So you take things that are already existing and you do a content analysis. That would be considered archival research. So I think that's it. So um, I know that was a pretty long lecture. Uh, but it is covering a wide scope of methodologies uh, that we're not using experimental manipulations. And then we have uh, next lecture is about quasi-experimental methodologies, which I believe should be a little bit shorter than this lecture. Um, so uh, hopefully you're able to sort of process a lot of this and use the study guide to help you process it. And I will talk to you in the next lecture.